and welcome to this bonus episode of Planet B, Everything Must Change. I'm Harpreet Kaur Paul. This episode features an extended edition of our interview with former journalist and activist Julian Brave Noisecat. You may have already heard clips of this interview in our episode on land and the global Green New Deal. If you haven't, make sure you check that out on the Navarra Media podcast feed. Before we get started, a reminder that you can order a free copy of Perspectives on a Global Green New Deal, the illustrated book on which this podcast series is based, at www.global-gnd.com. My name is Julian Brave Noisecat. I am a journalist, a writer, a policy advocate, and analyst. I'm currently the vice president of policy and strategy for Data for Progress, which is a think tank. And I am also working on a book uh, about indigenous peoples in the United States and Canada for Alfred A. Knopf. Uh, which is a division of Penguin Random House. Julian, thank you so much for joining us today. Last year, you wrote in a piece for Columbia Journalism Review that to be indigenous to North America is to be part of a post-apocalyptic community and experience. What do you mean by this? And how do these types of experiences affect your journalism and your broader relationship to the world? So... I am a citizen of the Canham Lake Band Eskin, which is a First Nation from what is now British Columbia, Canada. Uh, I grew up in the United States, but my indigenous roots are from the, the Canadian side of the border. And my people are um, survivors of uh, this very cataclysmic series of events uh, that dispossessed us of our lands and um, ended up killing many of our of our people and then abducted our children into a set of assimilationist uh, schools that are called residential schools in Canada. In, in the United States, we call them Native American boarding schools, but they were the same thing. And my life and my family's contemporary circumstances uh, and my people's um, social position remains deeply shaped, uh, fundamentally shaped, uh, even down to, you know, there's now studies of what's uh, called historical trauma and the ways that this actually shaped our our DNA and our genes and things like that, um, deeply shaped who we are. And uh, for many, many years, um, probably my whole conscious life uh, and certainly my intellectual and political life, uh, I've been trying to understand what this experience is, this experience that I'm, that I'm part of and that I've, I've inherited. And um, over the last number of years, I've also been thinking a lot about climate change and the climate crisis and my position amidst that as an indigenous person, but also as you know, a, a member of a generation of people who are inheriting a, a very broken um, earth and a, a, a climate that is rapidly um, devolving into something that is much different uh, from the atmosphere that supported all prior civilization, even the atmosphere that supported Homo sapiens and humans as, as we exist now. And the way that I've I've sort of started to think about and articulate this is as a apocalyptic experience and, and as an indigenous person being a post-apocalyptic person. So being the inheritor of, uh, of a series of earth shattering uh, events that, that destroyed the world as we knew it and experienced it, took away our languages, took away our lands, killed many, many people. Um, and I've written about this in a, in a, in a few different venues and I'm, it's going to be a, a major theme in my book. Uh, and the piece that I wrote for the Columbia journalism review, I visited the site of the, uh, wounded knee massacre, which is probably the most famous Indian massacre, um, infamous, I should say Indian massacre in United States history, uh, where over a hundred, um, 
Lakota people were gunned down by the United States military uh, and then buried in a, in a mass grave uh, in uh, what is now the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. And I happened to visit this place amidst uh, a climate-induced sort of extreme weather event where there was uh, massive flooding on the Pine Ridge Reservation, which led to loss of life um, and sort of compounded a number of existing social inequities uh, in ways that were just extremely apparent when I was there on the ground. So I was thinking through in that moment um, what it means for the genocide uh, that that is still very much uh, shaping native life today to collide with uh, the climate crisis, which is uh, just increasingly going to mount in cost uh, in terms of you know human suffering and, and life and things like that. And that's what I wrote about for uh, the Columbia Journalism Review. And then I also sort of was exploring uh, the challenges that those circumstances present to reporters. How do you you know capture these two enormous um, and still unfolding social and environmental systems in writing and in particular in the very small space that we are afforded in the media to, to, to explain and, and create a narrative around these sorts of things. You also write that knowledge of the apocalypse caused by colonialism helps make Indigenous peoples aware of ongoing tragedies. Can you talk about how this awareness um, takes form and, and how it shapes your perspective of contemporary climate collapse? To answer that question, I first have to explain why I was even searching for an answer. And the reason that I'm, I was searching for an answer is that um, as, uh, as an Indian, you know, you are born into a society that says that what Indians do is, is die and, and, you know, play this role of being, um, you know, a former sort of enemy and trope that was conquer conquered by um, the settler societies that took our land and, and you know, now form the United States and Canada and, and the bulk of the countries in, in North and South America today. And to inhabit that, that racial position is to feel as though um, you have you and your people have very little to offer to um, broader society and humanity uh, that, you know, all you can really do is, is, is play this, this role that existed in the past. And, you know, there is nothing uh, that your people or you have to contribute to uh, broader progress and, and justice and things that, you know, we're supposed to care about as um, you know, modern human beings. And, you know, I, I struggled a lot with that when I was a, a young person. I remember uh, reading about, you know, civilization, quote unquote, uh, when I was in sixth grade, I think, in, in, in middle school and about, you know, how agriculture and all these things were sort of the building blocks of civilization. And, you know, I had this whole bizarre set of um, inferiority complexes built around the fact that my people were not... Uh, agriculturalists we we built our society around the harvest of salmon from our rivers and and things of that nature and you know into my sort of young adulthood and then and, you know as I went off to school and got very interested in these sorts of subjects progress justice and indigenous people's space and role in that um, I started thinking about you know uh, especially amidst the climate crisis a circumstance where um, much of humanity is facing now earth shattering consequences. What, what are the things that a people who have experienced earth shattering um, uh, social realities, uh, you know, might, and environmental realities as well, actually, uh, might lend to a broader humanity. And, and I think one of them is, is um, you know, what it means to survive, what it means to um, persist, to honor what came before to mourn what was lost. Um, and then also to, you know, insist that the things that came before, even if they were devalued, uh, you know, in sort of racial um, sort of hierarchies of, you know, what kind of knowledge matters and does not, uh, to insist that, you know, some of our uh, forms of traditional knowledge, but also sort of, um, you know, that 
resilience and that ability to create beauty uh, in the wake of genocide and apocalypse, you know, is something that that is really going to be important and valuable to uh, humans who are now facing that kind of uh, not the same, but a you know a, a set of earth shattering circumstances uh, that are currently unfolding. And so this is an idea that I've been you know really a hypothesis, I guess, that I've been very interested in, and um, you know something that I sort of search for in uh, my reporting, my writing, and sort of my intellectual pursuits. When many people think of indigenous activism today. They often think of the fight against the Dakota Access or the Keystone XL pipelines. Can you tell us more about those struggles, but also put them into context of a long history of indigenous resistance against land colonialism? So uh, over the last decade, a number of land-based struggles against extractive industries and in particular fossil fuel pipelines have made national and international headlines. Uh, listeners are probably familiar with the, the Keystone XL pipeline, which was recently canceled by President Biden after over a decade of um, indigenous led resistance. Uh, listeners may also be, you know, familiar with the Dakota Access Pipeline, which um, is currently operating without all of its uh, legal permits, actually, and um, was the main focus of a resistance movement that uh, made global news amidst the, actually amidst the presidential election uh, in 2016 and, and attracted uh, tens of thousands of what were called water protectors, protesters, uh, who were standing in solidarity with the Standing Rock Sioux tribe as they tried to uh, stop the construction of this pipeline through their sacred sites, including burial grounds, as well as their water supply. And their sort of slogan was water is life. And they, they were saying this because uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline threatened the uh, Missouri River watershed, which is actually a major source of water for a large portion of the Midwestern United States. And those sorts of land-based uh, resistance movements, you know, though they're often discounted by uh, folks who are thinking about climate and environmental challenges, uh, have actually been a very significant source of grassroots activism related to climate climate change and in particular climate justice. Uh, and also I think point to a set of questions around uh, not just indigenous rights and sovereignty, which I think are, you know, the first things that we should be thinking about in those contexts, you know, whose land is it? Uh, what rights do, do first peoples have to, um, you know, control what is and is not developed through their homelands and certainly through their their sacred places, uh, but also to a set of questions around uh, environmental racism, you know, where things get built and why, who bears the disproportionate burden of pollution uh, on top of poverty, uh, and also, you know, how uh, we use land as we, you know, build out infrastructure, which is going to be, which has been a very significant question throughout the history of, of modernity and capitalism. And is going to be a very important question as we start to uh, try to decarbonize our economy and, and, and face very challenging questions about, uh, you know, what land gets used for energy development, what land gets used for agriculture, you know, how you protect uh, you know, indigenous communities and vulnerable uh, communities and, um, you know, how we balance all of these interests in a world that is very, very densely populated now uh, and where, you know, there, there are real shortages of, um, of land when, when you start sort of mapping out how we're going to fit all of the windmills and solar panels and uh, farms and all these sorts of things on the land that we, that we have. This interview is part of our episode on land in a global Green New Deal, and we've spoken to many activists and climate experts from marginalised communities across the world who've, who've highlighted exactly that, the importance of land rights and sovereignty in the fight for climate justice, exactly because of the power that it gives to decide what happens on land and who, who gets access to, to what happens on land. 
Can you add your voice to those calls from an Indigenous American perspective? Why is this issue of land so vital to achieving a just future? You know, I think it's easy in modern or postmodern society to disassociate and disconnect ourselves from place and land. You know, we spend so much of our days now plugged into the internet. We uh, don't have to work where we work. Um, you know, we, of course, can go to the supermarket and purchase all sorts of sort of uh, foodstuffs and animal products that are, you know, compartmentalized into units and are very much disconnected from the places that they come from and the, the living things that they come from. And I firmly believe that uh, to live in um, reciprocity and to live in a sustainable way uh, with the environment that that has always sustained our life you know we have to emplace ourselves we have to understand um you know where where we are where we come from where our ancestors are where they come from and also you know honor and and respect the things that um you know sustain and provide life and you know i don't i think there's a way to view that and articulate that that sort of is like indigenous peoples are the first conservationists or you know sort of in this sort of neo noble savage kind of way uh, but in like uh, in a more basic sense you know i think that once we sort of sever the tie between uh the human and other than human world you know it becomes increasingly uh, perilous that you know it becomes increasingly risky that we are going to overexploit and um, destroy some of these these systems these fundamental systems that sustain life and uh, you know eventually uh, things start running out you know eventually there is no more fish in the fisheries eventually um, you know we've pumped so much carbon into the atmosphere that. Uh, you know, the climate is unrecognizable to, to, um, to humans and to, you know, prior forms of life. Uh, you know, eventually some of these places that we relied on for things that are basic like water, you know, no longer provide us with water. And I think that one of the most uh, simple ways for us to um, not uh, go in that direction is to reassociate ourselves with, with, our land and with our place uh, in in the world. I wanted to ask about the concept of sovereignty. It's a term that we often use as a kind of shorthand for self-determination, self-determination in the face of multinational corporations and colonial states. So we hear it a lot um, when we talk about the need for sovereignty in order to free up financial and political space to build new and different kinds of infrastructures of resilience and care in the face of crisis. But it's also a term that is very steeped in the nation state as a political unit and the colonial capitalist baggage that, that comes with that. What can we learn from Indigenous philosophies and theories about what self-determination could mean outside of nation state form? So I think that most con uh, conceptions of sovereignty today are very much derived from what might be called sort of the Westphalian uh, nation state kind of model. This is the notion that the cultural unit or ethnic unit, the nation, you know, is going to always be congruous with the governmental unit, the, the state. Um, and throughout the, the, the 20th century in particular, uh, especially through the, the history of decolonization, which really accelerated this uh, after World War I and then after World War II, um, we had a, a, a period of state building that, that sort of drove sovereignty towards this model of, in a sense, homogeneity. And, and you know, across the world, there are many societies that are still struggling with this, with this sort of uh, challenge because, you know, uh, throughout the world, people were often living next to each other and with each other and speaking different languages. And, uh, you know, it was not a one-to-one -one relationship between uh, the cultural unit and the governing unit. And Essentially, I think one of the fundamental challenges that indigenous sovereignty poses to this kind of a model is the notion of, of pluralism and not just pluralism and diversity in the body politic, you know, in the in the set of people who are voting and electing 
their government, but also in the sets of governing authorities that can exist uh, alongside, prior to, and with the state. Uh, and in various ways, uh, different polities that have uh, indigenous peoples within them are contending with this kind of notion. We're contending with this in the United States, where there are over uh, 560 federally recognized tribes. Uh, in Canada, there's over 600 First Nations. Uh, and you know, throughout the Americas and beyond, there are various sort of systems that have been uh, developed and are still being sort of um, fought over between First Peoples and, and the government over how we are going to exist in societies that contain uh, that sort of uh, multicultural uh, indigenous kind of reality. And I think that that is actually like one of the most interesting and fundamental questions that, you know, we face in a globalized world is how do we, how do we live with, uh, the differences that are, that our societies contain, uh, you know, histories of difference that included, uh, acts of genocide by, you know, dominant and colonial groups over, uh, prior and indigenous groups. And, I think that the fact that you know indigenous peoples are raising these kinds of questions is is one of the most fascinating uh, questions of political theory and governance and and social justice in 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 contemporary um, society. I wanted to ask more about a long history of indigenous resistance against land colonialism. What tactics of resistance within Indigenous struggles can we draw on to inform today's fight against the infrastructures of climate breakdown? One of the most common forms of resistance that comes out of Indigenous uh, social and political movements is sometimes referred to as um, occupation, but I think more accurately would be characterized as reoccupation, essentially the assertion through uh, the presence of people of, you know, a claim to land and place. And uh, usually that's sort of a claim via treaty rights and agreements that have been broken and or through a prior form of governance that uh, was never extinguished and persists amidst colonial circumstances. So where I grew up in, in the Bay Area, um, in Oakland, California, one of the most significant and sort of um, was often acknowledged as sort of a starting point for the contemporary indigenous uh, rights movement was the occupation of, of Alcatraz, the former federal prison in the middle of San Francisco Bay, where in 1969, a group of native students and urbanites uh, reclaimed the, the island of Alcatraz under provisions of the Fort Laramie Treaty that basically said that federal land that was not being used by the federal government, at, you know, which was the case for the, the Alcatraz federal prison uh, after it was closed, could be reclaimed uh, by, by Native peoples. And sort of throughout Indigenous history, um, that kind of an act of um, reclaiming and reasserting uh, presence uh, in particular on land has been a, a very common form of, of protest and one that has also been seen in uh, non-Indigenous movements. You know, of course, there was the Occupy movement and in at Occupy Wall Street, where in another way, you know, um, the 99% or, you know, people who were uh, not the very small number of winners in our very unequal capitalist society, you know, uh, asserted their small d democratic right to, um, you know, place amidst, uh, you know, the sort of quintessential and, and central uh, place of, of like sort of the capitalist breadwinners, which is, of course, Wall Street. And, um, you know, I think that that kind of uh, tactic in a very basic sense of, you know, asserting uh, your place and your right to ground either, you know, literal territory or ground in, um, you know, sort of the, the, the political economy ground and, and right to uh, place in our economy in our, in our capitalist society uh, is a very sort of strong way to um, 
signal that you know the existing power structure the the sovereign entities that be are are being challenged uh on their right to um, govern or control a resource in the way that they are currently governing and controlling it and you know i think the fact that that kind of a protest tactic has um and, and sort of political strategy has emerged in multiple contexts and been employed by many indigenous peoples as well as non-indigenous peoples sort of attest to the fact that it's, uh, it's a pretty effective way to, to challenge power. I wanted to end with um, a question that relates back to the piece that I've been citing throughout this interview. We've spoken throughout this series about the importance of challenging and rethinking our fundamental spiritual relationship to the natural world, but also to each other. And you said in the Columbia Journalism Review piece that Indigenous experiences and perspectives challenge the notion that a press corps equipped with notepads and recorders can capture the whole truth. More often than not, I'm convinced that reality defies the disciplined space of stories, waging an epistemic resistance against the tyranny of language, text and form, something we Indians can relate to. Can you tell us what you mean by this? That whole article was a bit of a provocation. So I don't know if the whole thing could be considered a complete thought or more than sort of a broadly speaking, social hypothesis. But what I was trying to get at in that piece uh, towards the end was that in nonfiction, in writing, in journalism in particular, we are trying to convey uh, a story, right? And in the case of a people who experience the present as an extension of hundreds of years of very brutal policy of uh, hundreds of years of colonization and resistance to colonization as a genocidal experience, as a a apocalyptic experience. That is actually a very challenging set of, of, of things to sort of smush into a you know, 1,000, 2,000, even, you know, 5,000 word article or, you know, into something that could run on like NPR's morning edition. Um, And basically what I'm saying is that there's just so much that exists in a place like Pine Ridge, that exists in a place like Cannon Lake, where my family's from, that if you're trying to capture that story, especially amidst another unfolding story, uh, like the, you know, current climate crisis, like the ecological apocalypse that we're facing, it just becomes a ton to, to try to, to try to weave together. And I think that that in and of itself, um, especially when you add in the sort of time crunch of the news cycle and uh, the editorial bent of publications that maybe already have a particular story in mind, it becomes very hard to to fit all those things, to discipline all those, those threads into a single piece of writing or even into like a body of, of work. And in one sense, I think that that's like one of the fundamental challenges that these kinds of stories and realities pose to the practice of, of journalism and nonfiction storytelling, which is to say that these kind of stories are actually testing the limits of that craft and asking it to expand and asking it whether it can expand, uh, which is, I think, both a, a, an exciting thing and also a, a very challenging thing because, you know, maybe the answer to that question is these these forms of, of storytelling can't always actually rise to the challenge that uh, the world present it with. Yeah, interesting to hear you use that word discipline, the idea of disciplining what stories can and can't be told if we stick to the current ways of telling them and which stories are silenced. Thank you so much for joining us, Julian. It's been a real pleasure to to hear from you and hear from your experiences. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Planet B. 
This series was made possible by the generosity of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. It was written and created by Dalia Gabriel, Freddie Stewart and Harpreet Kaur Paul. The music and sound was produced by Ben Heidemann and the podcast artwork was designed by Tamika George. Just one final reminder that you can order the illustrated book on which this series was based, Perspectives on a Global Green New Deal, for free at www.global-gnd.com. You'll find the next documentary episode of Planet B right here on Navara Media at the same time in the same place next week.